Good morning, good day, and welcome to lesson two in our our introductory uh, classes uh, as we look at lesson two, uh, as we continue to look at Luke and the parables of Luke. And the lesson title today is How to Build a Storm-Proof Life. And uh, we're in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. Not a very long passage. Um, next week's uh, Bible study has a little bit longer passage. Page 22, if you're in the regular uh, study guide, How to Build a Storm-Proof Life. Uh, let's look at uh, the main idea of the lesson today. I always do this because, you know, we kind of need to drill down pretty quick and get to where we're going uh, to make sure that we really talk about things we need to talk about. But um, the main idea is the foundation for the Christian life is faith and obedience to the words of Jesus. And you... Uh, you can decide to be a believer and not be faithful. Uh, I don't think that makes you lost. Uh, it just makes you not a very good believer. Um, I think we've got lots of, of Christians, but not very many disciples, true disciples, that are faithful to the Word. did not make you lost. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they're missing out by not being obedient, and it really does affect your life. Quick read of the lesson is if you build your life upon Christ, he promises the storms will come. He's not going to keep your life perfect. The storms will come and the flood waters will rise, but you'll find stability in the storm. And he will carry you through the storm. And he'll make it okay. Um, not perfect, but his grace is sufficient. So let's give this lesson a little bit of introductory some things that I thought about as I started reading it and studying and praying over it and uh, the Bible, the Word started speaking to me through the Spirit. First thing is I'm a little bit leery of the term that the writer used in the uh, title of the lesson. Called it a storm proof. How to build a storm proof life. I don't know that there's no that there's a such thing. I, had, I was thinking about when I was a uh, in college, I worked for Zell's Jewelers, and it was really a great job, a real blessing to me. And, um, man, I sold a lot of watches. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I tried to hang out around the diamond counter because you could sell one diamond and make a lot more commission off of that than you would selling watches, but I'd sell anything. And some days and some nights was kind of slow, so I sold lots of watches, and people would want a they would come in and ask for a waterproof watch and i'd have to tell them there's no such thing as a waterproof watch there's water resistant watches but man's never created a a watch that's waterproof it's water resistant uh, there's still the possibility of water getting in there no matter how you build it and how well you seal it well um, I think that we we become faithful and build our lives in such a way to become storm resistant, not storm proof. Second thing, uh, I think that this section, as I read it, is equivalent to the Sermon on the Mount that we see in other gospel accounts. If you take your Bible and look at chapter 6, beginning in verse, oh gosh, around verse 17, um, he basically is in, um, you know, he's close to Capernaum and he takes the people out uh, into a field and he starts teaching them on the um, hillside. And uh, the, this begins a huge teaching section. A lot of letters in red for Jesus' teachings here. And it begins by saying, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's the Beatitudes. And so this is Luke's version of the Beatitudes. And um, so uh, part, part of what I wanted you to, 
to, to get from that is that we should read the context of these parables each week. There's not room in the curriculum to print all of that. And so I think every week as we look at these parables, uh, you need to go read what's around it. Where is he at? Who's he talking to? What's the context of the passage? I thought it was interesting last week's lesson started in chapter 5. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens in the book of Luke before chapter 5. Now I know we're focused upon the parables and the teachings of Jesus, which are wonderful. But go ahead and make sure you read the uh, context of each one of these parables as we study it. Uh, later it says that Jesus entered Capernaum. So he's, on, he's near the coastal uh, town of Capernaum. The remains of Capernaum were still there. You can visit it. I've seen a video of it. There's palm trees and lots of ruins. Actually, there's the um, a synagogue remains from Jesus' day. You can actually see the first synagogue under the um, ancient ruins of the second synagogue that was built on the same site. Uh, it's interesting, right across the road from the synagogue is Peter's house that the Gospels describe. And it's interesting that um, the Roman Catholic Church has built an elevated place of worship above uh, Peter's house on piers. And it looks like a flying saucer. It's the it's in most interesting thing. Now, I'm sure it's cool with big, huge window exposures looking out over the ruins, but it, uh, everybody calls it the Flying Saucer Church right there in Capernaum, the ancient town where Jesus taught in the synagogues. Well, um, one last thing is this whole section begins with the phrase, um, looking at his disciples. Uh, I think this means that he is addressing believers. Okay? And... Um, He's not talking about lost people need to think about how they build their lives. He's talking about saved people. And so, very interesting. He's speaking to us today about how we build our life. Now, very short passage. I only had two sections. First one, uh, Jesus talks about how people will call him Lord, Lord. And he said, if you call me Lord, Lord, then why don't you do what I tell you to do? Uh, if I'm your master, why don't you take orders from me? Why aren't you doing what I tell you to do? And then the second part of the passage is he, he tells, a, tells a parable about two different men who built homes, and they built it on two different foundations, and the foundation made all the difference in the world about what happened to the house. And, what he said, and he's relating that back to you need to really do and be obedient to my teachings. So, uh, let's look at the first one where uh, he says, people, you know, you call me Lord, Lord, why don't you do it? Well, here we go. Verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do and not do what I say? If I'm your master, ask for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. So he says, you know, there's a difference in a person who follows and does what I teach and those who don't. Uh, the word for uh, Lord here is kairos, K-Y-R-I-O-S, great, beautiful Greek word, and it means ma supreme master and owner. And it was used in the New Testament 667 times. That's a lot. And translated, uh, if it's six, 667 times the word was translated with a capital L uh, for Lord. And uh, it's the most, it's the word that most people would refer, used to refer to Jesus. They called him Lord. And it means um, supreme master or owner, like a slave owner, okay, uh, where a slave would call someone master. But it was uh, not a, a negative word, it was a positive word. Uh, it, it meant devotion and love and obedience. And so part of what he's saying is that you call me that, but your life is a contradiction. And you do not obey me. 
You say that I'm your Lord, but you don't act like it, okay? So I think one thing that I always think of is, again, Jesus the Lord gives us a choice to obey him. Uh, he doesn't just program it. Uh, we have free will. And there's uh, pluses and minuses to our free will. But um, he, he, he commands it, but he gives us the choice to obey or not to obey. I always, I feel strongly that it's to our own benefit that we obey the words of Jesus. He's not doing it particularly for himself. He's the God of the universe. He doesn't need me. He's doing it for me because he loves me. And it's for my benefit. Uh, I will prosper. I will do better when I obey him. And so, um, another thing is I've thought about this passage. The words of Jesus both influence how you think and what you do. Um, obedience begins in the heart, begins in the mind, and it fleshes itself out uh, from there. So let's look at this last passage where he talks about two fellows who went and um, built homes and uh, pretty close to the same place. I don't think it's two different locations, but one of them had a really great foundation and one didn't, and there were consequences to that. So here we go. Verse 48. They were like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. It wasn't on sand. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice, it's like a man who built a house on the ground with, without a foundation. Isn't that odd? Build a house without a foundation, but he did it. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Well, uh, the foundation. <laughs> Excuse me. How do you build a house without a foundation? Well, I guess it's possible, isn't it? Obviously, from the story, it's possible. One built a home on something solid, and the other one didn't. And the same storm struck both houses, and one survived, and one didn't. And it was all because of the foundation that was laid. Um, the foundation of our house of faith is hearing and doing the Word of God. Twice he said he um, put it into practice. Um, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice. That doesn't mean just one time. It means over and over again being faithful to the word of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, not just hearing them but doing them. And what he's saying is that it's a practice. You do it over and over again. You do it to the place where you don't have to think about it, but you, you do know him. Um, it's an act of obedience because you want to. You love him. You trust him. You follow his words. Uh, and when that storm hits, <clears throat> man, he, said, he uses the word the torrent struck. Uh, it's like flooding. Um, I grew up down on coast, and we know about floods. Uh, it's kind of a thing. It happens all the time. Um, people in Orange, Texas, where I served for 10 years before coming here, have been flooded over and over again. And um, they just know it's part of life there, and they do what they can to mitigate it and help it, but it's think. Uh, this is talking about a flood so powerful that it washes houses away. It destroys houses. The water doesn't just rise and come in. It's like a flood that just hits you. And uh, it moves a whole house. It takes a lot of force to do that. And water can do that. I think it's interesting that here in the Middle East where it's dry all the time, when it rained, man, it, water can become a problem. And it didn't happen very much. 
our son uh, was in the Air Force at Davis Mothin Air Force Base in Tucson, and Tucson's dry as a bone and, and hot or cold, no in between. But when it rains, man, Katie bar the door because here comes the water and it will just wash things away, same way. Israel's is exactly the same way, very destructive. They need the rain so desperately, but when they get it, it becomes a problem and it's destructive. And the force is powerful. And, you know, the point is that the, the man who built his house with no foundation and those that did faced the same thing, but they fared two different ways. And what was the difference? It was their foundation. So, you know, Jesus says, if you really are my disciple, if you're really going to call me Lord, then you have to put into practice the things that I teach and be obedient. Um, otherwise your house may collapse. And it's just, it's a picture of it being washed away down the stream. And as it goes down the stream, it, um, it collapses and falls apart. And we've seen people's lives who do that. It's a terrible thing to watch. And by then, it's too late to help. It's happening. And all there's left to do is help them pick up and move forward and rebuild. Well, I've put four truths down today as I looked at this lesson. First thing is storms will come. They do. Um, Jesus said this in John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. He's not going to just take us away. He's going to give us the strength to um, to withstand this the storm torrent <laughs> that strikes our houses um, if we've prepared for it we will stand firm second thing is how you prepare for storms affects how you will fare then i'm a firm believer in preparation uh, we go on a trip i'm thinking through all the details okay uh, we're headed to Germany next week to see our son and daughter-in-law and three grandbabies. And my babies are growing up, and uh, they're changing. The little one turned um, a year old, and uh, Lance was telling me that something on his mobile above his changing table f fell off. And he started to call Lance. Instead of calling him Daddy, he calls him D. He's D, D. He's pointing at something. And he was wanting his daddy to fix it. And uh, Lance fixes it, and he starts playing with it, and he's all happy. And you can just see the miracle of life happening with him, and he's maturing, and he's so smart. And uh, we want to see that. We want to see him. Uh, the middle child uh, had his hair cut, um, you know, and um, he looks like a grown kid now. <laughs> it's all cool and he looks grown but um, we're preparing for that trip and um, how you prepare for the storms of life affect how you will fare so I want to encourage you don't live in denial that it's never going to happen to you because it does and it will and so prepare for it uh, emotionally prepare yourself and deal with it okay it's going to happen it's okay um, do what you can to help it uh, now, okay? And that's what Jesus is talking about. That's a, that's a good, that's part of our core values is to know that things happen and to prepare for them as believers. Third thing is our decisions matter. Good, bad, or indifferent, we're going to live by our decisions. We're going to live with the good ones and we're going to live with the bad ones. So let's be obedient because it really will make a difference in our life. Decisions really do matter. Last thing is, I don't think Jesus is saying that once your house is destroyed and it washes down the stream and your life collapses, that you're forever out of God's will and it's over. No. I think that he, he is just saying, let's try to prevent those things. I'll give you the strength to uh, withstand these storms. But you can rebuild your life even after your life has fallen apart. We serve the God of the second chance. If your life has collapsed because of bad decisions, 
uh, where you haven't trusted God and you haven't been obedient and you haven't been the person God wants you to be, rebuild it. That's God's will for you. Uh, we love you. God loves you. Uh, don't just stay wallowing in the in the torn down house that was destroyed by the torrent of water and rain that happened when you didn't build your life properly and didn't have a foundation for it. Get up. Rebuild it. Rebuild it in a, in a stronger, godly way. That's God's plan for you. So it's not a forever thing. We serve the God of the second chance, and I'm so glad that he continues to bless us even when we're not obedient. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We trust you in all things. I pray that today we would be building a home with a firm foundation built on the rock of your word and the truths of scripture. I pray that it would be strengthened by our obedience, by being together with other believers and through prayer and Bible study and all the things that it takes to have a firm foundation spiritually, Lord, in our life. I pray for those today whose houses have fallen apart, that have been washed downstream by a terrible storm because of a foundation that was not firm. Maybe it's not even their fault, but it's happened, Lord. I pray for them that they would get up, dust themselves off, and rebuild their home and get on with their life and trust you in a better way. We love you. We want to be obedient to you. Help us to understand what that really means. In your name that I pray. Amen. God bless you. You have a great week. Love you.